Hello gentlemen, welcome to Accounting 429 Financial Statement Analysis. I'm going to be your instructor for this course this semester, so let me take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Al Jabir. My office number is 80 in the admin building, and my email is jabirm at ucj.edu.sa. Uh, you can feel free at all times to email me or even better to contact me through Blackboard in the discussion forum that I'm gonna create for you. This is a an exciting course. I specifically enjoy uh, the topics that are covered in this course and I wish that you all are going to enjoy it and um, have a fruitful discussion throughout the semester and together uh, we can make this a great learning experience. The main topics or the main focus of this course uh, is to try to take a look uh, and analyze how firms communicate through financial statements. Okay, so we're gonna try to understand how these financial statements are created and how can we uh, analyze them and study them, okay? so. You as a student is expected to learn how to analyze uh, a firm's financial statements uh, and disclosures to try to determine how the firm is um, taking accounting choices and how, uh, how uh, these accounting choices uh, reflect the underlying economics of that business. Okay, uh, The students are also expected to uh, learn how to interpret and analyze financial statements. We're going to focus on the main financial statements that are uh, usually uh, used. We're going to talk about that a little bit later today. Um, you're also going to learn how to analyze cash flows, uh, make judgments about earnings quality, and also try to dig deeper into financial reports and um, uncover any hidden assets, liabilities that the uh, corporation that you're analyzing is trying to hide from you. Okay, uh, We're going to also use those financial statements uh, analysis uh, prospectively to uh, learn how we could possibly forecast uh, a future uh, performance or future value of a specific firm, their growth potential. Okay, um, so uh, this is basically it. This course uh, is uh, um, very helpful for all business students uh, looking at um, or trying to decipher and um, disintegrate any uh, company information. Uh, it could help you a lot put a price tag on a specific on any specific company uh, make a valuation uh, judgment and based on that you can take uh, investment decisions all right all right so uh, this course contains two uh, parts or two components uh, we have theory and we have practical and the practical we're basically going to use uh, spreadsheets uh, we're going to be using Excel specifically so I hope that you at least have a uh, basic understanding of uh, Excel and how to work with Excel when it comes to uh, the marks or the um, mark distribution for this course you have 14% for the quizzes uh, we're basically gonna have two quizzes uh, out of 7% each quiz 1 and 2 then we have assignments 14% uh, as well so we have two, seven, and seven. Uh, midterm uh, theory exam out of 14 marks. Midterm practical exam out of 12% uh, percent or 12 marks. Uh, final theory exam out of 28. And the final practical exam out of 18%. All right, so that's pretty much it. And um, this is how the marks of this uh, course are distributed. Uh, basically, if you take them um, one at a time and try to focus your efforts following up with me, uh, you hopefully are going to be okay and you're going to achieve whatever grade that you are hoping for. Uh, try to avoid skipping lectures and uh, skipping doing the work 
because that gonna make you struggle uh, down the line in this course because uh, relatively all of the uh, chapters are uh, interconnected and, and relate to each other and build upon each other so try as much as you can to avoid missing any classes or um, practical work that we're going to be doing throughout this semester all right uh, if you're weak in excel if you have never used excel before um, this is not going to be my own personal responsibility so i would advise you to at least use the first couple of weeks of the semester to try to uh, build up at least a basic understanding of how excel works how to work with formulas how to um, uh, manipulate spreadsheets and build uh, graphs and tables and things like that all right so that is going to be your own responsibility for my part i'm going to be focusing on our work which is creating financial statements and analyzing them all right so i'm going to not going to be teaching you the basics of excel because that's going to be a waste of the class uh, time so please keep that in mind okay uh, wish you the best of luck throughout the course and let's get on to it two quick uh, uh, little notes before we start with chapter one uh, the mark distribution that i just have uh, i have just given you uh, is the mark distribution that has been used uh, in this course in previous semesters however you need to keep in mind that this might be changed for this special semester due to the e-learning environment and if that happens i'm going i'm going to definitely notify you with an announcement on blackboard or even during the lectures okay so that's the first thing the second thing is when it comes to the textbook the textbook that i'm going to be using or i'm going to be referring to throughout this semester for our work is the international financial statement analysis uh, third edition by um, Robinson uh, and it is uh, issued and published by CFA Institute so whenever you see any book references in the lectures or I, or I talk about specific pages in the page in the in the book uh, throughout the semester this is the textbook that I'm going to be referring to okay if you are using any other textbook that's fine but it's gonna be your responsibility to figure out the topics um, and the chapter distributions and things like that to be able to refer to whatever topic that we're talking about in your own textbook okay all right so here uh, we're going to look at the difference between the two sides of this equation we have the uh, the actual financial reporting generation okay or the financial reporting itself and the other side which is the analysis of those financial reports okay so the financial reporting is done by corporations to communicate their financial information to external users okay uh, for internal users on the other hand it, it uh, the the communication uh, is not necessarily done through financial reports it is done through any other uh, means uh, of communicating like budgets uh, plans letters uh, any other form that is uh, distributed or exchanged uh, internally within the organization because that is not subjected to any guidelines or regulations by governments and things like that however financial reports on the other hand are guided and legally uh, controlled by the government of the particular uh, country that the organization or the corporation is uh, operating in so it does have to abide by certain rules and regulations standards uh, for them to be relatively unified across the country and for it to be easier for analysts or whoever external user uh, uh, who is using that financial report to understand and to analyze okay uh, financial statement analysis is done after the financial report is generated and it's done by the external users to whatever purpose that they are looking into those financial reports for it could be a um, 
a bank that is trying to analyze financial reports of a specific corporation to decide whether to grant them a loan uh, or not, whether their cash flows are uh, strong enough to cover the payments for that loan and things like that. Could be done by investors, for example, looking into uh, investing in that organization, trying to evaluate the performance and the growth potential of that organization to see whether the current stock price is worth investing in or selling or keeping if you already hold a specific amount of uh, or a specific share in that organization. Okay, um, so that is basically the whole idea so you have your financial reports and you have your financial report analysis or your financial statement analysis that is done after the financial reports are generated i hope this is clear and helps you understand the idea and the purpose of financial reporting okay the when are these financial reports issued it depends okay uh, normally or the relatively uh, standard that is used globally is that most corporations issue quarterly reports and an annual report so when we say quarterly reports that means every three months uh, all corporations will be issuing a, a, a an announcement or a um, a um, issuing their uh, financial information through the reports that they issue quarterly to show their performance throughout that quarter and how how have they been uh, have they been doing okay and uh, legally they are required to issue their annual report okay which contains their financial information or their financial performance for the for the complete financial year okay so that is it we looked at the why all right so what is the goal of those uh, issuing those financial reports and what is the goal of analyzing those financial reports we talked about who issues those reports and who carries out the action or the uh, operation of actually analyzing those financial reports and we talked about when they are issued normally Okay, here is a, an, a snippet of a financial reporting, like an example of a financial re report that would be uh, issued by an organization. So this is a, uh, an Apple report. Uh, it shows the second quarter's results back in 2012. Uh, something interests for you to <laughs> look at here. Um, during that time, Apple's company share price was around uh, 93 94 dollars per share if you look at it today six uh, what is it eight years later um the stock price is around 501 i believe today 501 point something uh, dollars per share so that's more than 430 percent increase in the in the uh, value of the um, individual share of the company all right, so that I thought that is uh, an interesting thing to point out for you. Uh, however, here we just looking at um, an example of a, uh, a financial report. So a financial report doesn't necessarily have to be a, a financial statement. Okay, uh, this, for example, here is not particularly a financial statement. This is just a um, uh, an announcement that the company have made to show. Um, their performance during the second quarter of 2012 so it's a quarterly uh, report uh, usually these announcements would include some financial statements uh, not all of them most of the time it would be just the uh, balance sheet and the income statement sometimes the cash flow as well however you need to also bear in mind that these quarterly reports are not audited so uh, you can take them with a grain of salt, I guess, uh, because they're not uh, checked uh, by an external auditor. So, because these are not 
um, required in most countries for the quarterly reports, uh, at least particularly in this case in the United States. Only the annual report is audited. Okay, so these uh, all companies usually uh, issue press releases like this to show their earnings, uh, and mostly these would be interim, so they're not for a, a complete year. They're just for a specific quarter most of the time. Okay. Uh, the earnings announcements are an example of financial reports. Okay, so they're not financial statements. You need to differentiate between the two. When we talk about financial statements, we're talking about income statement, balance sheet, um, statement of cash flow, owner's equity statement, things like that. However, a report is any kind of announcement that the company makes that reflects uh, financial information. Okay. Um, if you notice here, if we read through, that was on April 24th, 2012 by Apple. Uh, they announced that their financial results for its uh, fiscal 2012 second quarter uh, ended on March 31st. Uh, of course, uh, you might uh, know that the fiscal year in the United States starts in September. So when we say first quarter, uh, that means the quarter that started in September and ended in December. Okay, when we talk about second quarter of the year, which is the quarter that ends on March. Okay, and then you have on the end of June your third quarter of the year, uh, and then again at uh, August, uh, last day of August is the end of the fourth quarter. Okay, which is going to be um, right now. Uh, at the time of recording this lecture tomorrow is going to be the fourth quarter where most of the american companies issue their annual uh, reports all right okay um so the company posted quarterly revenue of 39.2 billion and quarterly net profit of 11.6 billion or uh, in other terms 12.30 cents per diluted share so these are the uh, profits per share. Uh, these results compare to revenue of 24.7 billion and net profit of 6 billion or 6.40 uh, per diluted share in the year ago quarter. Okay, so they have a uh, tremendous growth in their net profits per share. Gross margins, however, were 47.4 percent compare compared to 41.4 percent we're gonna learn uh, later on uh, what the gross pro, uh, gross margin or the gross profit margin means exactly uh, international sales accounted for 64 percent of the quarters revenue so as you can see from each part of this uh, announcement you can get a piece of information so your job later on as an analyst would be to compile all these uh, bits and pieces of information together and uh, study them and based on that you could uh, hopefully come to a conclusion where you actually analyze the company and put a price tag or value to that company and divide that value across the number of shares outstanding and based on that you can come up to a number which is you would consider a fair price for that stock okay and based on that fair price you can compare that price to the current stock uh, price in the market and decide so if your valuation uh, is uh, lower than the stock price in the market the current stock price or the market price of the stock then you would uh, you would decide that the stock price is overvalued and it's not a good time to uh, purchase that stock if your valuation is higher than the market price for the uh, stock then you would consider that this is a good purchasing opportunity for you to get in and try to invest in that business all right so that's the uh, main concept behind it now here is the uh, a snapshot of a financial analysts uh, report based on the financial report that Apple released this snapshot you see in front of you here was produced by Seeking Alpha 
uh, and their goal here is to try to analyze the announcement or the uh, the financial report that Apple has released uh, and evaluated. So let's read through it and then discuss it together. Uh, that was issued on April twenty fourth, two thousand twelve. Okay, after the uh, Apple release, um, they uh, this is a part of the, the uh, this is not the full report. As you can see, there's just a section, uh, the first uh, part or first uh, portion of the uh, analysis report. Okay, so they say Apple reported results that blew past everyone's expectations, including our expectations. So basically they were expecting, um, based on their analysis for previous quarters, for example, they put a number where they expect the growth uh, that Apple can achieve, for example, and the margins and things like that. However, Apple had performed very well and surpassed those expectations. Apple reported quarterly revenue of 39.2 billion and quarterly profit of 11.6 billion or 12.30 EPS. When we say EPS, that basically stands for earning per share. Okay, so that's just an abbreviation for earnings per share. And uh, earnings per share is a very important metric that is uh, used to show the earnings available to common shareholders. Okay. Uh, this surpassed the 10.07 uh, consensus estimates from the analyst community. Apple saw growth due to strong sales, growth from all of its uh, product lines. Revenue enjoyed a mammoth 59% increase versus the second quarter of 2011. And earnings per share grew by over 92%, which is huge. Uh, earnings per share growth was also aided by a higher gross margin, which was aided by lower commodity input costs associated with Apple's products. Okay, so the things that uh, we notice here in this um, uh, analysis report is that the analysts are comparing the results to expectations and comparing the results to previous uh, performances uh, in, in the same time last year for example in this example okay which is the the common practice so when you want to compare the results of a third quarter of 2012 uh, you most likely want to uh, compare that to the third quarter of 2011 because you want to avoid any normal cyclical changes in the economy that come along or that uh, occur during the year so usually you want to stick to that uh, rule of thumb okay they focused on the growth uh, in both revenue and earnings per share okay because it is an important metric that helps uh, uh, investors in making decisions and they also focused on the profitability uh, i.e the higher gross margin okay uh, you also notice that t they try to explain uh, or to um, to theorize some of the reasons that could play a factor in that increase. So they just don't tell you that, wow, this is a great number and it increased. They also tried here to um, tr explain some of the reasoning behind that, which is, uh, which is what makes a good uh, financial analysts okay so they referred for example to the lower commodity input costs as being a contributor to uh, Apple's higher profitability okay uh, and this is really important because it is an example of how an analyst an, an analyst could explain the reasoning for a company's financial performance okay um, uh, the analyst uh, also aimed not only to describe what happened in the company, but also uh, to explain the underlying reasons of why that happened, which is which is uh, an indicator of a good financial uh, analyst uh, analyst report. Okay. So from this quick example, uh, I hope it is uh, 
clear for you to see uh, the importance of financial reports uh, analysis and uh, as an activity uh, to be done so based on uh, or depending on the um, entity that is performing or carrying out that financial analysis the goal of the analysis uh, is then uh, decided so if we look at the example that we just discussed this is a financial analysis that was carried out for investors okay so their main focus was on the things that are important to investors the financial analysis could be also carried out by banks as I mentioned uh, earlier in this lecture and then in that case their goal would be to verify cash flows and focus on the cash flow generation and the the strength of the cash flow generation of a business uh, because eventually their main interest is in that corporation's ability to uh, pay its debts all right it could also be carried out by government agencies and in that case the government uh, agency's goal would most likely be taxation purposes so they would attempt to verify uh, all the um, profits uh, uh, that the organization or the corporation made for taxation purposes to see exactly uh, how much they need to tax that corporation okay and the need of course arises because financial reports often uh, more often than not actually hide more than they uh, reveal okay so uh, this is a practice that is put in place to make sure that the numbers or the reports actually uh, reflect the actual financial position of an organization okay and also to look beyond the numbers to put uh, theories and interpretations on what those numbers actually mean for uh, the the interested user uh, for the investor or for the banks or governments all right so i hope this part is clear and i hope you find this example helpful to you now here we're going to look at the things that we are gonna need if we're gonna carry out financial analysis for a corporation so in conducting the financial analysis of a any corporation uh, we as analysts will regularly refer to the company's financial statements financial notes supplementary schedules and uh, press releases and all of these things a variety of uh, information sources so we need to gather as much information about the, that corporation as we can okay um, and that uh, collection of information is carried out by the financial analyst before he can uh, carry out his analysis of that corporation okay and uh, in order to perform uh, the equity or credit analysis of any corporation uh, you as an analyst will need to collect a great deal of information uh, the nature of that information uh, collected would vary uh, as I mentioned before based on the uh, the uh, individual decision that need to be made so whether uh, the analysis is carried out for the purpose of investment or for a government agency or for a bank uh, then that might change the the nature of the information collected a little bit okay but uh, regardless it will typically include uh, information about the economy as a whole the uh, the industry that that corporation uh, operates in or you could call it a the sector so if we are trying to analyze SABIC for example we need to have an idea uh, about the um, um, petrochemical uh, industry uh, in general uh, the company um, as well as information about comparable peer companies so if I'm analyzing uh, Bank al Riyadh for example I need to also have uh, collected some information about com uh, competitors you might say like Bank al Ma and uh, Saudi Investment Bank and so on all right uh, that could help you a lot as an uh, as an analyst to uh, 
generates a um, full understanding and a complete analysis for that bank okay uh, much of the information uh, will likely come from outside the company such as economic statistics uh, industry reports uh, trade publications databases um, containing uh, information uh, on competitors and so on okay and there are certain uh, software and subscriptions that are actually used in the industry to get that kind of data uh, the company that we are analyzing itself would also provide some of the core information uh, for the analysis in its financial reports okay um, and also in their press releases and their um, investor uh, conferences their website their social media all of these could help you as an analyst to dig deeper and collect as much information uh, as you need about the corporation okay part of the financial report uh, reports of course is the financial statements of that corporation which brings us to this slide that you see in front of you now the financial statements um, there's so many financial statements out there however the main ones that are required uh, by global standards such as the IFRS and GAAP uh, to be uh, released by organizations are the five uh, in front of you so first we have the statement of financial position which is the balance sheet it's the same thing okay a statement of comprehensive income okay which is the income statement as we usually call it uh, a statement of changes in equity okay which is basically the equity statement and statement of cash flows and finally uh, notes okay which is basically a summary of the significant accounting policies and other explanatory information uh, that the company includes in their reports to explain some of the estimates and the accounting decisions that are uh, used within the financial reports all right now here we begin uh, looking into those uh, different financial statements uh, individually and try to understand them i'm pretty sure that by now you have already came across these statements before in your accounting courses you probably have worked with them and uh, created some of these or even all of these reports the only new one that you might not be aware of is uh, is the notes um, report okay or the notes statement however for the rest of these the other four you probably already have a good understanding uh, of them however uh, for the purpose of this course i'm going to go over them and break them down for you to uh, even uh, better your understanding okay uh, so here we start with the statement of financial position which is basically the balance sheet itself uh, which uh, role or its job is to list all that the company owns which is the assets of the company and uh, what it actually owes to other entities uh, which is known as their liabilities and finally the amount of its ownership which is the difference between their assets and liabilities so this is a statement that is designed around the basic um, accounting equation that you all already know which is assets equals liabilities plus owners equity so it's basically just that equation however it's uh, formulated into a statement okay or into a table all right uh, you could uh, interestingly um, if I don't know if you have came across this before or not however you could use the same concept to evaluate yourself uh, as a person um, of course your value is much greater as a human being but if you uh, attempt to evaluate your own uh, value or uh, as it's known your own net worth uh, you could basically use the same format to try and put a number on how much you actually own all right so the way to do this is that you need to list all of your assets everything that you own uh, for example your your bank account 
uh, your cash your uh, car how much it's valued at your cell phone uh, all of that you can put them all together compile them into your assets uh, site and then you look at how much you owe to other people uh, if you borrowed from your friend um, Ali uh, um, 50,000 you know list that if you've borrowed from uh, your friend Khalid you list that if you've borrowed if you have a bank loan for example uh, you list that and so on into your liabilities uh, side and uh, then you figure out the difference between uh, between the two and that will give you a number that number is basically your own and uh, it's worth okay so it can be applied to organization it can be applied to people as well so as an example let's assume that you have a uh, a house uh, let's let's call, let's uh, use a car uh, instead it might be more straightforward most of you uh, I don't know if uh, any of you would have a house by now at this age so let's talk about a car uh, if you have bought a car uh, for a hundred thousand for example okay the the car price is a hundred thousand you need to pay uh, a down payment uh, let's say twenty thousand okay um, and the rest of the amount is going to be paid by installments uh, so uh, in this case your asset side will contain a car uh, let's say it's a land cruiser for example uh, that land cruiser is worth one, worth one hundred thousand. It's going to be on on your assets side in the uh, report in the statement, and then on the liability side, you're going to have how much? Eighty thousand, which is the remainder of the price of the car that you did not pay in your uh, down payment, and then the difference between those two. Allah, Allah, Allah. Okay, let me stop for a minute for Adan to finish, and then I'll be back. okay sorry for that interruption uh, back to our example so you bought that Land Cruiser which is priced at hundred thousand okay you put a down payment of twenty thousand and then the rest of that money you're gonna be paying um, as a loan you're gonna be paying on installments monthly installments so that means your assets side will contain hundred thousand your liabilities side will contain twenty thousand and then the difference uh, sorry, your liability side will contain 80,000 and then the difference which is the 20,000 is going to be your own uh, Your own equity or your own net worth. All right It is also worth mentioning that the balance sheet is prepared as a point of time uh, So it basically represents a snapshot of you or of the company in a specific t uh, time uh, or uh, so it doesn't really cover a period like the other financial statements we, which we're going to be talking about shortly all right so it's in a particular time so back to your uh, example with the land cruiser if the following day for example you decide to buy uh, a, a cell phone uh, uh, valued at uh, five thousand then that money must come from somewhere either from a loan or from your own uh, personal money so if you had some cash in your assets side, let's say you have 10,000 in your bank account, that means your assets side contains 110,000. And then instead of having that 10,000 uh, as cash, it's gonna be uh, reduced to 5,000. And then your cell phone or your mobile account is gonna be increased by 5,000, okay? I'm pretty sure you're already aware of that from your accounting courses, but it's uh, just a good, thing to make sure that we're all on the same page and that that you clearly remember all those uh, details all right uh, using the balance sheet and applying financial statement analysis uh, the analyst which is in this case yourself can answer uh, uh, different questions so you could answer um, on the liquidity side uh, you can try to answer the question has the company's liquidity improved uh, from the previous uh, financial periods you can also answer if the company is solvent so basically does it have sufficient resources to cover its obligations 
Do they have enough liquidity? Do they have enough uh, assets that they could uh, sell off to cover their financial obligations? Uh, you could also answer the question that uh, the companies uh, are regarding the company's financial position uh, relatively uh, in the industry. Are they leading their industry or their sector? Are they uh, competing well uh, compared to their competitors? So all of these uh, things can be uh, considered and looked into in your analysis. Now here we have a uh, an example of a uh, balance sheet or a financial position statement. Uh, this is for Hershey Company. Um, this one from their 2011 uh, second quarter to the, um, 2011 uh, sorry first quarter uh, because you can see it it is on the end of December 2011 okay uh, notice um, I, I believe you have came across similar reports uh, statements before but there's a few things that I need to point out for you to pay close attention to Notice the uh, format, of course, you start with the assets on the top and then after that, when you're done with all the assets, you uh, move on to the liabilities. Okay, and finally, the last section would be for the shareholders uh, equity. Okay, uh, you need to also pay attention to the heading. You always need to, uh, when you're creating a, um, a balance sheet statement, you need to make sure that your heading includes three pieces of information the name of the company the name of the financial statement and of course the time period that the financial statement uh, covers okay uh, now uh, notice at the top uh, under the company name you see the word consolidated consolidated basically means that the balance sheet is for that corporation which is Hershey in this case and all of its subsidiary uh, subsidiary companies okay uh, any company that they own a controlling uh, ownership in it will also be included in the uh, financial uh, statements all right you notice this especially with large corporations that uh, have uh, multiple subsidiaries working underneath them all right uh, you also need to note the currency de uh, denomination so you need to make sure that you are aware which currency is used for that balance sheet because uh, it is important to uh, understand that uh, and also finally you need to notice the totals so you see the total assets exactly equals the total liabilities and stockholders equity uh, as based on the accounting equation that we know and use Now here we have another uh, consolidated balance sheet or consolidated financial position. Uh, as you can see, the um, the style kind of looks a little bit different. There's a few things that I'm going to need to point out for you to differentiate between, between or understand why is there differences between this one and the previous one we looked at. However, don't let this uh, throw you off. So this one is for a Swiss company uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna be pronouncing this correctly I think it's called Linton Sprugli um, company I hope that's correct however we'll just call it Lint for now um, this is a, a Swiss chocolate maker and as you can notice here that they have their assets um, we are on the snapshot only shows the assets side of their uh, balance sheet okay however if you uh, look a little bit closer you'll see that uh, just as the previous Hershey example they have their uh, assets broken down to current and non-current okay because this is in accordance with IFRS the International Financial Reporting Standards uh, however, the standards do, don't really require you uh, or require the uh, corporations to present the classified uh, balance sheet. This is called the classified balance sheet, by the way, when you break down assets and liabilities to current and non-current. So they require classified balance sheets. However, they do not um, have any requirement when it comes to the order 
of representing current and non-current. So you see here for Lint Company, they are showing their non-current assets first and current assets uh, second, unlike Hershey, where they have non uh, they have current assets first on the top and then non-current. Okay, so this is largely dictated by uh, the company's tradition or what they are used to doing. Okay, um, you notice also that the balance sheet is denominated in millions of Swiss francs. Okay, so uh, when you see at the top, for example, property, plant, and equipment, seven. Uh, 142.1 that actually means 742 uh, million Swiss francs and 100,000 okay and finally um, you notice that Lint also presents certain line items as a percentage of the total assets okay uh, which is a also a common practice uh, so when you notice the total non-current assets 872.5 million Swiss francs. You notice that right next to it, um, it says 34.7%. That means this figure actually represents 34.7% out of the total assets for the company. Here we have the liabilities and equity side for Linton Sproge Group. Uh, you also, uh, looking closely at this, you'll notice that uh, Lint presents the owner's equity before liability. And within liabilities, also they are representing non-current liabilities before current liabilities, okay? Which is different from the previous one. Uh, this method generally reflects uh, a representation or uh, form uh, from least liquid to most liquid okay so for the assets they put the least liquid assets which are the non-current assets at the top and then the current assets and same thing applies for this side of the statement okay here we move on to the uh, second financial statement that we're going to be talking about or focusing on uh, which is a statement of comprehensive income all right um, it is also known as the uh, income statement this is what we use as a terminology most of the time or statement of earnings or even profit and loss statement okay uh, the uh, basic equation underlying this specific statement is revenue plus other income minus expenses equals net income all right so that's the uh, equation that is behind this specific statement um, this can be uh, presented as a single statement of comprehensive income or some companies use two consecutive statements so both uh, methods are allowed all right um, the income statement mainly shows the net income, which equals, as we discussed, the revenue minus expenses. Uh, the uh, income statement pertains to a period of time, unlike the balance sheet, which, for, which only presents a specific point in time, like a snapshot. This one actually covers a complete period. So let's say a month or most likely a quarter or a whole year. All right. And the uh, things that are included in this uh, statement, as I mentioned, are the revenues. So you list all the uh, revenue that the company have generated throughout the period. Uh, you also add to that other sources of income. Okay. Um, or other sources of income or OCIs. Uh, actually, um, that include items of income that bypass the income statement. Uh, an example is any gains or losses on any uh, on available uh, for securities that are available for sale uh, if a company owns securities that are classified as available for sale uh, based on the accounting rules and regulations they are required that these securities be shown on the balance sheet uh, at their fair value okay uh, so the market value uh, but the changes in that fair value is shown in other comprehensive income in the comprehensive income statements all right so i hope that uh, that is clear for this one we're going to see a few examples uh, in the following slides 
Here we have Hershey's company consolidated statements of income. All right, so take a, um, a quick look uh, in that slide. Try to see what you can figure out, and I'll talk about it a little bit in further detail. Okay, so um, as you can see, presented on a consolidated basis, meaning that it includes the income and the expenses of Hershey and all of its subsidiary companies for which it has controlling ownership. Okay, so the mother company, which is Hershey Company, and any subsidiary that they control is all reflected on this uh, statement. Notice that the top line is net sales, which were around six billion in 2011. Okay and after that we have a subtraction of all the expenses uh, you see that the income the net income comes to a around 629 million in 2011 all right Hershey also presents a subtotal for income before interest and income taxes okay this is really important this is called EBIT presentation of this subtotal is fairly typical so you need to be aware of what EBIT means, E-B-I-T, which is a, an abbreviation for earnings before interest and taxes. Okay. Uh, the income statement also shows earnings per share. Okay, so net income per share. You see it down in the bottom. Okay. Uh, companies present both basic and diluted earnings per share on the face of the income statement. Earnings per share numbers represent net income attri attri uh, uh, attributable to the um, uh, class of shareholders. So if the company has uh, multiple classes of shareholders, which is typical, uh, many companies do, um, they'll be divided by the relevant number of shares of stock outstanding during the period. So basic earnings per share is calculated using the weighted average number of common ordinary shares that were actually outstanding during the, the, the specific period. And the profit or loss attribu uh, uh, attributable to the common uh, share owners. Okay, Diluted earnings per share uses diluted shares the number of shares that would hypothetically be outstanding if potentially uh, dilutive claims on common shares um, uh, sh uh, on, on common shares um, for example stock options or convertible bonds uh, if they these um, common shares um, were ex exercised or converted by the, uh, their holders and an uh, appropriately adjusted profit or loss attribute um, uh, I'm not going to be able to say this word correctly uh, attributable to the common uh, share owners okay uh, this is m more of a detailed information don't don't worry too much about it uh, my main concern is with the um, format the uh, the main items that are represented here that you can see um, to have a good understanding of what a consolidated statement uh, of income usually looks like. Uh, for Hershey, their situation is a little bit uh, complex, as I mentioned, because they have multiple classes of common stock. So if you go to this particular report from back in 2011, uh, you will look down in the notes section. We're going to be talking about notes later on as well in detail you will see that the footnotes uh, to this financial statement which is uh, which are not shown here disclose that the holders of the two classes of common stock have different uh, voting rights and different uh, dividend amounts okay so basically they have uh, um, uh, common stock holders have one vote per share uh, and the holder and this is for uh, class a and for class B stockholders have 10 votes for, per share. And also the common stockholders are entitled to cash dividends uh, of 10% higher than those uh, declared and paid on the class B stock. Okay, also class B stock ha uh, can be converted into common stock on a share uh, for share basis at any time. Okay, so uh, that is the source of complexity in the um, 
a statement uh, considering that the company has two classes of shares okay however mainly the important parts are the net sales uh, and the expenses also understanding what is an EBIT means or EBIT which is earnings before interest and taxes and coming up to the important figure of net income or in some cases net loss here is another example for you okay again back to Linton Sprugli group uh, this is their consolidated income statement from 2011 okay um, again we're looking at it to uh, compare and contrast between that and what we've seen for Hershey so here you'll see that Lint has um, or had two sources of income uh, they had their sales of two um, two thousand or basically two billion and four hundred and eighty eight million and other income of 10.3 million Swiss francs okay after subtracting operating expenses Lint had uh, operating uh, profit of 328.7 million note that this item uh, is income before interest and taxes the one we talked about earlier okay um, or earnings before interest and taxes which is the EBIT all right and final thing to note is that Lynch shows certain items as a percentage of total sales okay um, as I mentioned before this is a common practice this is called a common size income statement when you see a, a, an income statement with uh, percentages like that um, it is called common size income statement and it's very useful um, to for forecasting uh, which we're gonna be discussing later now here is the uh, Linton Sprugli group again um, they present their comprehensive income as two consecutive statements remember we discussed that um, corporations have the freedom to either uh, present one complete um, comprehensive income or two uh, consecutive statements all right so this is what this specific corporation chooses to do so this is the second or the uh, second statement uh, you notice that it starts with uh, the income the net income from the previous statement at the top okay uh, and then presents components of other comprehensive income uh, the OCI we talked about one of the components of Lint's uh, comprehensive income as previously mentioned is uh, unrealized gains uh, or losses unavailable for sale security you can see that in front of you on the one two three fourth line okay uh, the other components are discussed in subsequent uh, readings so we'll talk about them uh, when it when it is appropriate now here we look at the uh, statement of changes in equity okay which is the third statement of the main statements that we're going to be uh, discussing remember we talked about five different statements uh, to focus on this is number three okay uh, it is also known as a statement of changes in owners uh, equity or statement of shareholders equity it's basically the same thing uh, this also covers a period of time as I told you before only the balance sheet covers a snapshot so it only focuses on a specific uh, point in time however all the remaining uh, statements basically cover a complete period like a, a quarter or a complete fiscal year um, and this statement is based upon uh, a simple equation again which is the beginning equity so the the equity value at the beginning uh, of the financial period that the statement is covering plus any changes that happened during the year okay which is eventually going to give us the uh, equity at the end of that specific financial period okay so um, the goal of this report is to cover all the changes in owners uh, investments in the business over the period of time or over the specific period that this statement covers um, 
the basic components of the owner's equity are paid in capital and retained earnings so basically um, any um, value that is generated by uh, owner's equity uh, or by the corporation can be um, either retained for uh, future investments by the corporation or basically uh, distributed to investors in the form of dividends okay so other uh, very important equations to keep in mind when you're working with a uh, statement of changes in equity are the um, ending common stock how to figure out the ending common stock value so basically the beginning common stock plus any uh, new issuances so basically new shares uh, being issued during that financial period minus any uh, um, share repurchases that the corporation does uh, repurchasing uh, stocks this is a also a common practice by corporations especially in the recent years many uh, global corporations are doing this so what they do is basically when they generate good profits and especially if the stock price of the organization is low uh, in their own evaluation they would uh, repurchase their own stocks okay and retire them uh, second equation uh, that is useful is how to figure out the ending retained earnings which is basically the beginning retained earnings plus net income minus dividends which will give you the ending retained earnings okay and the last one is how to find out the ending uh, accumulated other comprehensive income which is calculated by the beginning uh, balance for that same account plus any changes in the other uh, comprehensive income that occurred during the period okay so here we have our first example of a consolidated statement uh, of stockholders equity uh, uh, again we're going back to Hershey uh, company uh, this is their um, consolidated statements of stockholders equity for 2011 you see it in right in front of you um, pay attention to how it is broken down you see the columns um, at the top show each line uh, item of shareholders equity that is included on the company's balance sheet and notice that the far right column way at the the far right side is the total column okay the first line shows the beginning balance of total stockholders equity uh, the balance at the end of 2010 which is basically the previous year uh, is the balance at the beginning of 2011 so the totals at the bottom which is the balance as of december uh, december 31st is going to be the opening balance for the following uh, financial period and so on okay some of the items uh, let's comment on them uh, notice for example that the column labeled retained earnings increases by the uh, amount of net income so 628 um, and 962,000 uh, and decreases by the uh, dividends paid to the common stockholders Hershey also presented its other comprehensive income for 2011 as a loss of 227 uh, million and 264,000 uh, on its statement of shareholders equity after 2011 that presentation format is no longer allowed under US uh, GAAP under gap standards so you're not allowed to show a um, other comprehensive uh, income in your uh, consolidated statement of stockholders equity uh, during 2011 shares of class b stock were converted into common stock you could also see that reflected in the uh, statement okay now we'll look at another example uh, we'll go back to Linton Spruglia again. This is a consolidated statement of changes in equity for Linton Spruglia Group. Um, again, notice that 
um, the style is a little bit different but basically the main items remain um, similar the um, the template is relatively uh, consistent okay um, you notice the first column showing the amount of shares and participation certificate capital that is uh, paid in capital of 23.3 million at the end of 2011 and the far right column displays the total which is basically 1,619.1 million at the end of 2011 uh, other items are summarized on the uh, balance sheet as well okay Now we uh, get into the fourth financial statement, which is a statement of cash flows. Uh, this statement in particular is very special, okay, uh, because it only focuses on the changes that occur uh, in cash throughout a financial uh, period. So although we have a, already the net income statement and the balance sheet, which provide a good measure of a company's success uh, in terms of their performance and financial position, however, uh, the cash flow is also very very important not a lot of analysts pay enough attention to that because uh, it is very important to see how the uh, corporation is managing uh, their uh, cash flows which is a really good indicator of their long-term success okay uh, the goal of uh, or basically first let's start with the basic equation uh, it, it is uh, this statement um, mainly covers uh, the beginning cash flows uh, or the uh, opening balance for cash and the uh, add to that the changes that occur to cash during the financial period and you end up with a figure that reflects your closing cash amount or the ending balance for the cash account okay changes in cash can occur from uh, various um, causes it could be operational changes so basically from the organization's activities uh, it could be investing uh, impacts that affect cash so if the organization and is investing in specific projects or financial instruments and finally financing so any funding or borrowing activities will also impact uh, cash okay the goal of this statement uh, is basically disclosing the sources and uses of cash uh, it helps creditors investors and other statement users to evaluate a company's uh, liquidity solvency and financial flexibility all of these are really good uh, measures of a uh, an organizational uh, success okay Financial flexibility is uh, basically the ability of a company to react and adapt to financial uh, adversities that uh, face them. Okay, um, a, a current day and age example would be airline companies. All of a sudden, uh, with COVID-19, you have airline restrictions, and suddenly they're not generating uh, their uh, their normal uh, revenues that they used to generate and you see that all of a sudden um, major airline companies are struggling a lot and some of them even going under so if you look at uh, if you go out today and google uh, america uh, american airline companies for example delta and all of these different airline companies in the u.s you will see that uh, they had to be bailed out by the u.s government because they did not uh, essentially have enough cash reserves to help them uh, in tough times such as uh, what we're going through right now so uh, many great investors uh, because of that had to basically uh, bail out of um, their investments in airline uh, big or large uh, airline organizations uh, or companies in the US okay so as an organization just as in personal uh, financial management you always need to um, treat your cash properly and you also need to have cash reserve uh, reserves in all situations to save you 
in case of emergencies so if a company is not prepared for uh, such times uh, that is a an indication of uh, bad management and it could be a good enough reason for you to avoid investing in such companies the cash flow statement classifies all cash flows of a company into three categories basically operating uh, investing and financing as we mentioned because these three factors are the factors that directly impact uh, uh, any org uh, any uh, corporation's uh, cash reserves uh, cash flows from operating activities are those cash flows not classified as investing or financing and generally involve the cash effects of transactions that enter into the the uh, determination of net income okay so they make up the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the company itself its production and its sales uh, cash flows from investing activities are those cash flows from activities associated with the uh, acquisition and disposal of long-term assets such as property and equipment all of these are considered investment cash flows and finally, uh, cash flows from financing activities are those cash flows from activities related to obtaining or repaying capital to be used in the business. So basically, all the uh, funding uh, and, and repayments of funds uh, in the business. IFRS permits more flexibility than US GAAP in classifying dividend and interest receipts and payments within uh, these categories. So this is also worth noting all right so let's look at a few examples of uh, statements of cash flows in the following slides so this is the uh, consolidated statements of cash flows for uh, Hershey company okay so uh, looking at this I would like you to go first straight to the bottom We'll begin at the bottom uh, of the slide you will notice that the overall uh, overall change in Hershey's uh, cash was a decrease of 190 million nine hundred and fifty six thousand okay this is the third line from the bottom you notice it says decreased increase in cash and cash equivalents uh, notice also the uh, a quick note the the decrease is also always represented uh, in brackets okay so when you see any figure in uh, financial statements that is in brackets you need to understand directly that this is an, a cash outflow or a, a decrease a reduction in the amount beginning cash was uh, 884 uh, million and 642,000 so the change uh, leaves an ending balance of 693 million and 686,000. So basically, we took the cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the period. We deducted the change that occurred during the year, and then we end up with the the um, closing balance, okay, or the ending balance as of uh, December 31st. Both the beginning and ending cash balances also are also presented in the uh, balance sheet so if we go back to the balance sheet for uh, Hershey you'll see these figures represented there as well next uh, let us look at the components of cash flow so uh, ideally for an established company such as Hershey you need you the uh, or you as an analyst would like to see that the primary source of cash flow is from their operating activities okay so from the business itself they are generating good cash as opposed to um, generating more cash from investing or by financing activities uh, here you see that this is the uh, case uh, with Hershey. So in 2011, the company generated 580 million 867,000 from their operating activities. Okay, they used 333 um, uh, million, just over that, um, in um, investing activities. So mainly capital additions, uh, and used 438 uh, million. Uh, more than 438 million in financing activities so mainly for uh, dividends and repurchase of common stocks okay 
The operating activities section of Hershey's cash flow statement begins uh, with net income, okay, six hundred and twenty-eight uh, million and nine hundred sixty-two thousand, and makes adjustments to reconcile net income to the amount of cash generated uh, generated from operating activities. So we end up with a five hundred and eighty uh, million amount. Details of the adjustments are shown uh, are not shown here uh, for presentation purposes. Uh, it would make the uh, slide a bit too long. It's not going to be uh, fitting to the slide size, so it was omitted. Um, this approach in reporting uh, cash flow from operating activities is termed uh, the indirect method. Okay, so the direct method of reporting cash flows from operating activities discloses major classes of gross cash receipts and gross cash payments. Examples of such classes are cash received from customers, cash paid to suppliers and employees and so on. Unlike the indirect method, which uh, emphasizes the different perspectives of the income statement and cash flow statement. So on the income statement, uh, income is reported when earned, not necessarily when cash is received, and expenses are reported when they are incurred, not necessarily when paid. So that's basically the accrual accounting style. Okay, the cash flow statement presents another aspect of performance, which is the ability of a company to generate cash flow from running its business. Okay. In this case, uh, Lint's uh, an uh, organization or Lint Group statement of cash flow is similar to this one, so. This is why it was not present, uh, presented here in your slideshow. So this is going to be your only uh, example for a consolidated stat statement of cash flows. However, uh, you can feel free to uh, Google and find uh, other examples of your own and try to look at them and understand them. This could help you a lot in your study. Now we come to the uh, last part or last statement that we uh, need to carefully look at as an analyst, which is the accompanying notes. You'll notice that in any financial uh, reports that you find um, on uh, companies' websites or on the internet, you will notice that it, also, uh, it will always include uh, notes or sometimes they're called footnotes. Okay. Uh, the footnotes basically provide information that is essential to understanding the information provided in the primary statements. So um, you need to make it a habit of yours to look at these as you go along the uh, financial reports. Many uh, beginner financial analysts uh, kind of underestimate the importance uh, of this step in their analysis. Uh, a company's significant accounting choices uh, policies, methods, and estimates must be discussed in the notes to the financial statements. So you'll always find as part of the notes some comments on the accounting uh, methods and policies and their estimation methods as well uh, that the uh, company have used. Okay. The notes, uh, so they include information on the uh, accounting choices the uh, they could in include information uh, or explanatory information about uh, line items on the face of the financial statements uh, especially for the um, balance sheet and the income statements so the um, the financial notes uh, will always provide explanatory information about uh, every line uh, in these particular statements in addition, uh, notes uh, could contain other uh, disclosures such as commitments and contingencies and so on. So all of these you will find in the uh, footnotes of the financial reports. Uh, based on that, the, uh, you as an analyst must understand the accounting choices that the company have made and determine whether they are similar to those of other companies identified. Um, and used as benchmarks. So when you're comparing two companies together, you first need to make sure that the accounting choices are similar between the two. Otherwise, your comparison between the two um, 
might be um, uh, not really uh, accurate uh, and you might make analytical mistakes because of that so if they're the same that's great you can go ahead with your analysis or your comparison if they're different you then need to make necessary adjustments to um, to make them uh, to adjust and make them um, comparable okay and as always uh, to help you have a better understanding um, here is an example of what a disclosure of accounting principles in the notes might look like uh, here we go back again to Linton Sprugley group uh, this is again from their annual report in 2011 and it illustrates typical uh, disclosure about accounting principles so here for property plant and equipment PP and E um, the company is um, having or commenting on three uh, issues the first one is that the values of its PP and E at historical uh, cost less accumulated depreciation so this is how they value their um, plants property and equipment uh, remember from your accounting uh, course you're probably already aware what historical cost means but just to remind you it basically means that uh, they use the price they actually paid for that uh, specific property plant or equipment when they purchased it so they don't use the current market price they use the um, historical uh, price or historical cost okay and then they subtract the accumulated depreciation just like what you've learned in accounting uh, they use straight line method for their depreciation calculation uh, and the third thing that they capitalize is uh, expenditure uh, that will provide future benefits and that can be reliable reliably calculated and expenses uh, all other expenditures in the year incurred so in the, in the current year that the expense have occurred in okay for comparison Hershey basically uh, use same principles for their uh, property plant and equipment um, they um, use costs um, value okay historical cost and depreciated uh, on a straight line basis over the estimated useful lives of the assets um, the number of years is not really important here for us um, however um, this is um, from your accounting uh, course you probably are probably already aware of when you set up a specific useful life for a an asset um, they expect the asset to last for and then you use that to estimate how much depreciation you need to expense every year here's an example of the uh, second uh, note type or second type of disclosure we discussed which is this a disclosure of line item <clears throat> okay as you can see from the expert uh, excerpt uh, from uh, note 7 of Linton Sprugley Group Annual Report 2011 here you, see, you can see um, it illustrates a disclosure providing detail about a line item on the balance sheet which is the uh, PP and E line item okay and it shows a total of uh, 742.1 million uh, Swiss francs okay this note discloses acquisition cost of um, 1758.8 of course that's in um, millions so basically 1 billion 758.8 million uh, Swiss francs and total accumulated depreciation of uh, 1 billion and 16.7 million which nets to uh, the 42.1 million shown on the balance sheet okay uh, the footnote also discloses the uh, composition of uh, uh, property plant and equipment uh, reading across each column we see that the net PP and E comprised uh, 336.2 million uh, land and buildings 322.3 million machinery uh, 34.8 million 
other fixed assets and uh, finally 48.8 million construction and process the footnote also discloses detail about additions retirements uh, impairments transfers and the effect of uh, currency translation okay third example here this one is for a disclosure in notes okay again for the same uh, company Linton Sprugley group from their 2011 annual report uh, this one shows that the company has contracted for uh, but not yet incurred 24.7 million capital expenditures as of the um, balance sheet date so basically after they have created their balance sheet they have uh, signed the contracts uh, for a um, or a capital expenditure contract for this amount okay so I mean they mentioned that in their notes okay uh, other than the uh, statements we already discussed the four statements plus notes um, being used as a tool uh, or as a source of information for a financial analyst there are other um, um, sources sources of information uh, that we're going to be covering uh, in the following few slides so the first one here for example is the management uh, commentary okay we also have the auditors uh, reports and we also have some other uh, information sources that we are uh, going to uh, look into for the management commentary, um, okay, uh, the uh, publicly uh, held companies typically include a section in their annual reports where the management basically discuss a, very, a variety of uh, issues of concern, including the uh, nature of the business, uh, past results, and even uh, future expectations and outlook. Uh, this section is referred to by uh, uh, various names including management reports okay uh, management commentary uh, operating and financial review and uh, management discussing discussion and uh, analysis okay so all of these uh, different names are basically for the same exact thing um, some companies even uh, call them um, management letter okay uh, some companies even hold conferences um, for um, to discuss uh, the same issues um, some companies hold annual meetings as well uh, like uh, Berkshire Hathaway for example um, inclusion uh, inclusion of management report is recommended by the International Organization of Securities uh, okay um, so uh, it is uh, a legal requirement and and most countries um, so uh, such as the uh, US SEC or the UK Financial Services Authority uh, they all require the um, uh, listed uh, corporations to include the management commentary in their uh, financial reports uh, in, uh, in Germany for example management reporting has been required since 1931 and is also audited in Germany okay uh, the discussion by management is arguably one of the most useful parts of a company's annual report besides the financial statements in themselves however other than excerpts uh, from the financial statements information included in the management's commentary are normally not audited okay so you as an analyst need to uh, be aware of that and make sure uh, confirm that these uh, um, comments uh, whether these comments are audited or not and if they're not audited then you need to be careful when you uh, use uh, any of the, the information presented in the commentary in your analysis so what can we find as analysts in a uh, management's commentary uh, the uh, management's uh, commentary um, could include various uh, items as we discussed in the previous slide uh, to help improve the quality of the discussion by management 
the International Accounting Standards Board, uh, IASB, issued a, uh, a, an IFRS practice statement, uh, management commentary. Okay, So the practice statement provides a broad, uh, however non-binding framework for the presentation of management commentary that relates to financial statements uh, prepared in accordance with IFRS. So when we say non-binding, basically it means that uh, companies are not really required uh, by the standards to be uh, including these items. However, these are just general guidelines. Um, so the practice statement is not an IFRS. Uh, so consequently, entities are not required to comply with the practice statement unless specifically required by their uh, jurisdiction. So what is the recommendation here? The recommendation is to include um, the um, the nature of business, management's objectives and its uh, strategies for uh, meeting those objectives, the entity's most significant resources, risks and relationships, the results of uh, operations and prospects, and uh, the critical performance measures and indicators that management uses to evaluate the entity's performance against uh, against uh, stated ob uh, stated a uh, objectives. All right. So the particular focus of management's commentary will depend on the facts and the circumstances of the entity. Uh, but the practice statement provides uh, guidance only uh, on the contents of the commentary. So uh, not all management commentaries are going to include all these five items and focus on them. Okay. The management commentary, or MD&A, is a good starting place for understanding information in the financial statements. Uh, in particular, the uh, forward-looking disclosures in the uh, MD&A, such as those about planned capital expenditures, new store openings, uh, or uh, divestitures, uh, can be useful to uh, project a company's future performance. Okay, so it can help you a lot as an an investor to. Uh, get an idea of what the future of the business uh, should look like okay however the commentary is only one input for the analyst seeking an objective and independent uh, perspective on a company's performance and prospect so uh, take these as a uh, or with a uh, grain of salt as they say because basically every management of an of a corporation in the world would uh, only tell you what they want you to know okay so don't uh, base don't ever base your evaluation solely based on what is included in the management commentary okay you need to uh, as a good analyst you need to come up with your uh, uh, your own uh, analysis and draw your own conclusions Here is an example of MD&A explanation of amounts in financial statements from, again, our favorite company, uh, Hershey. I'm pretty sure most of you would like some chocolate right now. Uh, this excerpt uh, from Hershey's MD&A illustrates an explanation of the uh, components of the company's 2011 uh, sales growth uh, of 7.2%. Okay. Uh, sales growth attribute, uh, attributable to price increases was 3.5% to volume was 3.4%. Okay, and to favorable impact of foreign currency exchange rates was 0.3%. So here they're basically trying to explain where this net sales increase of 7.2% uh, arised from. And as you can see, um, almost um, half of it was because they have increased their price uh, on their products okay increased prices on their products and the other half was an actual growth in sales so volume volumes of um, or numbers of units sold was increased by 3.4 percent and the last uh, very small fraction of 0.3 percent was just uh, due to foreign exchange rates, okay, being a global company that works in uh, various uh, global markets and eventually all the uh, sales amounts would need to be exchanged back to uh, US dollars eventually, okay.
Here is an example of MDNA information on the company's prospects. Um, these are basically bits and pieces of information that was collected from the um, reports, from Hershey's report. The information shown here were found in different sections of uh, Hershey's MDNA. The sales and earnings information was found in a section labeled Outlook whereas the anticipated capital expenditure information was found in a section discussing cash flows. Okay, This excerpt uh, from Hershey's MDNA uh, uh, illustrates information on the company's prospects, basically um, um, future expectations. Okay, You as an analyst uh, can use these uh, prospective information as one input in your uh, analysis. Okay, uh, however, uh, you need to draw your own uh, forecasts uh, of the company's performance. Okay, so don't just use this as your forecast. Okay, just use this as one part of the inputs that you're going to be in your own uh, analysis. Now, another source of information that the analysts could use is the auditor's reports. Okay. Uh, audit reports take slightly different form uh, in different jurisdictions. So uh, from one country to another, it might look a little bit different, but the basic components, including a specific statement of the auditor's opinion, are similar. All right. Uh, audits of financial statements may be required by contractual arrangements uh, or might be required by law or regulation. However, especially listed corporations are always required to um, include a uh, auditing report in their um, financial uh, reports. Uh, international standards for auditing have been developed by the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board of the International Federation of Accountants. Uh, these standards have been adopted by many countries and are referenced in audit reports issued in, the, in those countries. Other countries, such as the uh, United States, specify their own standards, uh, their own auditing standards with the uh, enactment of the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 in the United States. Uh, auditing standards of public companies are uh, promulgated by the public uh, company accounting uh, oversight board. Okay. Under international stand, uh, standards for auditing, ISAs, the objectives of an auditor in conducting an audit of financial statements are to first obtain uh, reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements as a whole are free from material mistreatment, whether due to fraud or error, thereby enabling the auditor to express an opinion on whether the financial statements are prepared uh, in all material uh, respects in accordance with an uh, applicable financial reporting framework uh, and for the and the uh, second objective uh, for uh, the audit uh, auditor's report is to report on the financial statements and communicate as required by the ISAs in accordance with the uh, auditor's uh, findings so basically the goal is to um, to uh, solidify what was represent what was uh, presented by the corporation in their statements, uh, make sure that it's uh, accurate, make sure it uh, delivers a fair representation of the uh, company's financial position, uh, make sure it's uh, free from any fraud or misleading uh, representation and things like that. So for you as an analyst, it's always better to uh, work with audited reports, okay? Because the audits are done or carried out by uh, independent companies, um, uh, so um, on paper they should be uh, clear from any biases uh, or um, bad intentions, okay? So if your financial report that you're working with is audited, uh, then that gives you a good indication of the fairness of that financial report that you could, uh, whether you could depend on it or not. Okay. 
Publicly traded companies may also have requirements set uh, by regulators uh, or stock exchanges, such as appointing an independent audit committee uh, within its board of uh, directors. Uh, the goal of these uh, this committee is basically to oversee the audit process. The audit process provides a basis for the independent auditor to express an audit opinion on whether the information presented in the uh, audited financial statements uh, present fairly the financial position, performance, and cash flows of the company in accordance with a uh, specified set of accounting standards. Uh, and because audits are designed and conducted using audit sampling techniques and financial statement line items, it may be uh, based on estimates and assumptions. So independent uh, auditors cannot, in this case, uh, express an opinion that provides absolute assurance about the accuracy or precision of the financial statements. Instead, the independent audit uh, report provides a... Uh, um, a uh, reasonable assurance that the financial statements are fairly presented, meaning that there is a high probability that the audited financial statements are free from uh, material error, fraud, or illegal acts that have a direct effect on the financial statements. Now it's also good to um, be aware of the different levels or the different types of auditors reports okay so we have uh, multiple uh, levels of um, auditors reports strength if you uh, want to call it uh, first we have a uh, unqualified audit opinion um, which is which states that the financial statements give a true and fair view or are fairly presented in accordance with applicable accounting standards. This is often referred to as a clean opinion and is the one that you um, want to uh, look at as an analyst. This is the kind of audit, uh, auditor's report that you want to see okay, in your financial reports. Uh, there are several uh, other types of opinions. A qualified audit, for example, uh, which is basically um, uh, a, uh, an auditor's uh, report uh, or opinion in which there is some scope limitation or exceptions to accounting standards. The exceptions are described in the audit report with additional explanatory paragraphs so that the analysts can determine the importance of the exceptions. So uh, basically, <clears throat> could say that it is a uh, clean uh, audit opinion with some exceptions all right so this level we call qualified or this type we call qualified audit opinion okay then you have um, an odd an adverse audit opinion which is issued when an auditor determines that the financial statements materially depart from accounting standards and are not fairly presented an adverse opinion makes analysis of the financial statements easy. Do not bother analyzing these statements because the company's financial statements cannot be uh, relied on and uh, they could be misleading. All right. So you don't want to uh, do the work and analyze um, a specific organization uh, in case their uh, auditor's reports um, states uh, or gives out an adverse audit opinion uh, so the financial reports in this case are fine uh, basically worthless and they're not worth uh, analyzing uh, finally a uh, disclaimer of opinion uh, occurs when for some reason such as a scope limitation the auditors are unable to issue an opinion so they uh, which basically means that uh, the auditors are saying that uh, they cannot uh, for some reason for one reason or another they could not uh, safely uh, um, confirm or check back check the financial statements presented by the corporation it is also worth uh, looking at internal control systems uh, so 
The internal control system is the company's internal system that is designed, among other things, to ensure that the company's process for generating financial reports is sound. Um, in some companies, um, you have internal controller uh, or internal control department, and some uh, companies they just hire what is called an internal auditor. Okay. Uh, some countries require an additional audit opinion on the company's uh, internal uh, control system. Okay, so this is also uh, another layer of protection uh, that is put in place um, and required legally uh, to um, to uh, confirm uh, financial statements reliability. Okay, or financial uh, reporting uh, safety and reliability. Okay, now that we looked at the main sources of information for the organization, which are uh, the um, financial statements, okay, we've broken those down to balance sheet, uh, comprehensive income, changes in equity statements, uh, cash flow statements, and financial notes, okay. Uh, also, the management uh, commentary or management comments and the uh, auditor's uh, report. Uh, now let us uh, look at um, other uh, sources of information besides the annual financial statements. Okay. Annual report or proxy statements, which are statements uh, distributed to shareholders about matters that are uh, to be put to a vote at the company. Um, Okay, so that's one of the other sources. They usually include information on the uh, management and director compensation, uh, company stock performance, and any potential conflicts uh, of interest that may exist between management and the board uh, and shareholders. Okay, you also have uh, interim reports, which uh, also provide uh, are also provided by the company. Uh, either semi-annually uh, or quarterly, depending on the uh, applicable regulatory requirements. Um, companies also provide relevant uh, current information on the on their websites, uh, in press releases and in uh, conference calls with analysts and investors. Uh, one type of uh, press release, which uh, analysts often consider to be particularly uh, particularly important, is the periodic earnings announcement. So the earnings announcement often uh, happens well before the company files its uh, formal financial statements. And if you pay attention to the news, you'd usually hear news about um, um, earnings announcements from different companies. Uh, such earnings announcements are often uh, followed by a conference call in which the company's senior executives describe the company's performance and answer questions posed by conference uh, call par participants. Uh, following the earnings uh, conference call, the investor relations portion of the company's website may also post a recording of that uh, conference call accompanied by slides and supplemental information uh, discussed during the call. Okay, another one analysts should also review, which is uh, information from external sources regar regarding the the economy as a whole uh, and the industry that the corporation uh, operates in, the company itself, and also uh, peer companies like uh, competition, competing companies. Uh, information on the economy um, might be things like, um, uh, or a good example of that would be things like what we're having right now with COVID-19, okay, uh, unemployment uh, numbers, um, uh, GDP uh, of the country, um, the uh, the um, the, the uh, step or the um, current phase of the economical cycle that the um, the economy is going through all of these factors uh, could help uh, guide your analysis uh, being also aware of the industry and its changes uh, in the uh, regulatory framework of that particular industry industry whether it's um, being um, 
regulated, uh, controlled, any new decisions that the government uh, can take uh, if they have an impact on that industry, positive or negative, uh, such as what happened with the uh, American airline companies when they got bailed out recently by the American government. Uh, peer companies, you look at them, of course, as well to um, to use them as a benchmark for your analysis. So if you look at sales growth, for example, for company A, and you compare it to company B's sales growth for the same period, and you see that the company you are, um, you're evaluating has a significantly lower uh, growth in their sales number from the previous financial period to this period, uh, then that could be a red flag for the uh, organization. For that's just an example of uh, benchmarking. Okay, uh, in most cases, information from sources apart from the company are crucial to analysis uh, effectiveness. Okay, for example, an analyst, uh, an analyst studying a consumer-oriented company will typically seek direct experience with the products so taste the food or drink use the shampoo that the company produces or soap visit the stores or hotels okay things like that um, an analyst following a highly regulated industry will study the existing and expected relevant regulations as i mentioned before these could have a huge impact on the future outlook of uh, the company that we're analyzing. An analyst uh, following a highly technical industry, on the other hand, will gain relevant uh, expertise personally or seek input from a technical specialist on all the intricacies and details of the technical advancements in that spe uh, specific uh, sector. In some, uh, through research goes beyond financial reports so um, as an analyst you need to have or to create a um, um, a whole uh, assembly of uh, sources to collect uh, the information from and the main purpose of that is to be able to look at the big picture of the business and not just uh, fixate on the uh, numbers presented in the financial statements, for example. Okay, so the the more holistic your look for the uh, corporation is, the the better understanding you'll have uh, around it, and the uh, better outcome or analysis that you uh, would be able to uh, generate. Now we'll move on to the final uh, learning outcome of today's lesson, uh, the uh, financial statement analysis framework, which is basically uh, the steps that you are, uh, as an analyst need to take to perform a financial statement analysis, okay, or the phases that you need to go through. So you have the uh, first phase, which is to uh, articulate the purpose and context of the analysis basically set up your goal of the analysis. What are you aiming to achieve by the analysis? What is your purpose of that analysis? Okay. The second phase would be to collect data. Okay. You go out there and research, get all the uh, data that you can get, um, get all the documents we talked about earlier, the financial statements, the auditor's reports, the uh, management commentary, and so on. Okay, so you collect all of these. Then you uh, process these data in the third step. Okay, uh, sort them out. Um, decide which ones that you're gonna include, which ones to eliminate, which ones are helpful to your analysis, which ones are unnecessary and so on okay this is how you process your data we'll talk about it in detail uh, in the coming few slides we'll explain each of these phases uh, number four you actually carry out your analysis and interpret the data that you had processed okay number five you develop and communicate conclusions and recommendations based on your analysis and interpretations 
And finally, for the last uh, phase, you follow up on the uh, communication that you have made. Here we'll discuss the first phase in a little bit more detail. So prior to uh, undertaking any analysis, it is essential for you to understand the purpose of the analysis, okay? Uh, an understanding of the purpose is particularly important in financial statement analysis because of the uh, numerous available techniques and the substantial amount of data that you're gonna be faced with. Uh, some analytical tasks are well defined, in which case articulating the purpose of the analysis requires little decision making by the analyst. Uh, for example, a periodic credit review of a, an investment grade debt uh, portfolio or an equity analyst uh, report on a particular company may be guided by institutional uh, norms uh, such that the purpose of the analysis is given and straightforward. Okay. Uh, furthermore, the format, procedures, and uh, sources of information may also be given, okay, which will make your, uh, your work a lot easier. For other, uh, for other analytical uh, tasks, articulating the purpose of the analysis requires the, analysis, um, the analyst to uh, make decisions. Okay, the purpose of an analyst, uh, uh, the uh, purpose of the analysis uh, guide further decisions about the approach, uh, the uh, tools, the data sources, the uh, format in which to report the result of the analysis, and the uh, relative importance of different uh, aspects of the analysis. Okay, uh, when facing a substantial amount of data. A, uh, a new analyst or a less experienced analyst may be tempted to just start making calculations and generating financial ratios without actually considering what is the uh, relevance uh, for the decision uh, at hand. Uh, it is generally advisable to uh, resist this temptation and thus avoid unnecessary or pointless efforts. Consider the questions. Uh, if you could have all the calculations and ratios completed instantly, Okay, with a snap of a finger, what conclusion would you uh, be able to draw? Uh, and what question would be uh, able to be answered? Okay, what decision uh, would your answer support? Okay, this could help you decide what to use and what not to use. Uh, the analyst should also define the context at this stage. So who is the intended uh, audience? Who, who are you doing this for? what is the end product for example a uh, final report explaining conclusions and recommendations uh, what is the time frame okay how long you or when is the report actually due uh, what resources and uh, resource constraints are relevant to completion of the analysis okay so all of these factors need to be taken into consideration again the context may be predefined i.e. standard and guided by institutional norms so that in that case uh, everything is going to be easier for you uh, having clarified the purpose and the uh, context of the financial statement analysis the analyst should uh, next compile the specific questions to be answered by the analysis for example if the uh, purpose of the financial statement analysis or uh, more likely the particular stage of a larger analysis is to compare the historical performance of three companies operating in particular uh, in a particular un industry uh, specific questions would include the following uh, what has been the relative growth rate of the companies uh, what has been the relative prof uh, profitability of the companies and so on all right Now the following three phases would be to collect data, process data, and analyze data. Okay, so when you collect the data, a key part of this step is to uh, obtain an understanding of the company's business, uh, financial performance and financial position, um, including trends over time and in comparison to other competitors and so on. For historical analysis, financial statement data alone are adequate in some cases. 
okay for example to screen a large number of alternative companies to find those with a minimum level of profitability financial statement data alone would be adequate for that case but to address more in-depth questions such as why and how one company performed better or worse than its competitors uh, additional information would be required uh, as another example, to compare the historical performance of two companies in a particular industry, the historical financial statements would be sufficient to determine which uh, had faster growing uh, sales or earnings and which was more profitable. However, a broader comparison with overall industry growth and profitability would obviously require uh, a larger amount of industry data. Furthermore, information on the economy and industry is necessary to understand the environment in which the company operates in, okay? Um, so in tough times like we are in right now, if you see um, a, uh, a shrinkage in, in sales of a specific company, uh, especially in the, um, in the tourism sector or the airline sector, cruise ship, uh, these sorts of companies, that would be understandable considering the the circumstances in 2020 so you cannot judge that company based on um, a reduction in their sales numbers for for this year for example okay so that would be an example of taking economical factors into consideration uh, analysis uh, analysts often take a uh, top-down approach whereby they gain an understanding of the macroeconomic uh, environment such as prospects uh, for growth in the economy and inflation uh, unemployment rates and things like that okay and then analyze the prospects of the industry itself in which the subject company operates based on the expected macroeconomic environment and finally determine the prospects for the company itself in the expected industry and macroeconomic environments for example an analyst may need to forecast future growth in earnings for a company the second phase or the next phase would be to process data okay so in order to process data uh, using a um, uh, appropriate analytical tools you need um, to have a good grasp of the tools or that you're going to be using in um, your analysis uh, such as computing ratios or growth rates so if you make mistakes in those in in using those that would be an issue okay uh, preparing common size financial statements, uh, creating charts, performing statistical analysis such as uh, regressions or uh, Monte Carlo simulations, performing equity valuation, uh, performing sensitivity analysis. Uh, all of these you need uh, to have a, a good grasp of as an uh, an, um, uh, an analyst. Okay, so um, you cannot. Um, make mistakes when employing those analytical tools now a comprehensive financial analysis at this stage would include uh, reading and evaluating financial statements uh, of course including the notes and other disclosures for each company being analyzed okay uh, making any needed adjustments to the financial statements to facilitate comparison remember when we discussed um, changes to accounting um, practices that might be um, um, available in um, certain financial reports or differences between uh, different companies in their financial reports so you need to adjust in accordance to that okay if your uh, companies that you're comparing have similar uh, accounting practices um, especially if they come like from the same jurisdiction same com same country they're following same accounting standards and accounting choices then you have no issue but if you're comparing uh, apples with oranges you cannot do that you need to transform uh, the apple to an orange or transform the orange to an apple before you compare them together okay so that's basically it um, preparing or collecting common size financial statement data 
uh, which scale data to directly reflect percentages. So if I'm comparing a big company to a smaller company uh, in, in, num in, in, in sheer numbers or sheer size of the organization, uh, that could be misleading. Okay. Um, so it also makes it easier to compare changes uh, of sales, for example, or percentages of sales changes in uh, from uh, year to year changes and financial ratios, which are measures of uh, various a, um, aspects of corporate performance based on financial statement elements. Okay, so you need to uh, take that into consideration when you're carrying out your analysis. On the basis of common size financial statements and financial ratios, analysts can then evaluate a company's relative profitability, liquidity, leverage, uh, efficiency, and valuation in relation to past results and or even peer uh, comparisons or competition comparisons. Uh, next step would be to analyze uh, and interpret the processed data. Uh, so once the data have been processed, the next step uh, which is uh, critical to any analysis is to actually interpret the output. Okay, so put a meaning behind the numbers and the words. The answer to a specific financial analysis question is seldom the numerical answer alone. Okay, so uh, you cannot give me a number and tell me uh, and say that this is your analysis. It actually needs to be the uh, answer to the analytical questions. Uh, <clears throat> the question relies on the analyst's uh, interpretation of the output and the use of this interpreted output to um, support a specific conclusion or recommendation that you want to give to the end user. Okay. Uh, financial uh, statement analysis typically involves assessing a company's profitability, liquidity, leverage, efficiency and valuation relative to its own past okay so this is called a trend analysis so you're comparing the company's performance to of this year with what the company have been doing in previous years okay called trend analysis and relative to peer okay uh, or competitors which is called benchmark analysis okay uh, in the analytical uh, circles it's these two are also called uh, horizontal analysis and vertical analysis okay as a common term so when you're um, comparing a company with uh, competitors uh, you uh, call that a um, horizontal analysis okay uh, uh, when you're comparing a company to itself over time you call that a vertical analysis or a trend analysis all right the following phase would be to develop and communicate conclusions or recommendations to the end user okay so uh, basically communicate your uh, analysis conclusions and recommendations you need to do that in an appropriate format okay so uh, you need to comply to standards that may require specific disclosures and that differ is different from one country to another so you need to be aware of the regulatory environment in your own country if you're working as a uh, financial analyst appropriate format will vary okay as i said uh, an equity analyst's report for example would typically include the following components it needs to include a summary uh, and investment conclusion uh, basically a recommendation whether to buy hold or sell a specific investment uh, it needs to include earnings projections okay it needs to include the valuation of the business a uh, business summary uh, risk assessment of that investment this sometimes is also a legal requirement for you as an analyst to disclose the risks associated with uh, your recommendation uh, industry analysis and uh, competitive analysis okay historical performance needs to also be included and finally uh, you also need to include forecasts of the uh, outlook or the future of that business that you are evaluating 
Now the final phase in the um, financial analysis framework is the follow-up phase. Okay, so if an equity investment is made uh, based on the recommendation or a credit rating is uh, assigned, periodic review is required to, to determine whether the original conclusions and recommendations are still valid. And we actually see this uh, presented by uh, major financial analysis uh, corporations around the world from time to time. So um, the likes of Goldman Sachs, uh, JP Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, all of these uh, major financial analysis or financial services organizations, they would uh, analyze a specific company, uh, for example, uh, in 2018, and then maybe um, whatever time later, maybe six months or a year later, something major changes either in the uh, corporation itself or in the economy or in the sector. So they would issue a follow-up, okay? So they don't repeat the complete analysis. They just issue uh, a follow-up to their analysis and basically state what what is their uh, current opinion on the uh, on the corporation that they have analyzed based on the new changes that occurred okay the follow-up may involve repeating all the previous steps in the process on a periodic basis or it may just contain an update as I mentioned before if an equity investment is made or a credit rating is assigned uh, the periodic review is issued. In case the uh, of a rejected investment, uh, follow-up may not be necessary but may be useful in determining whether the analysis process is adequate or should be refined. For example, if a rejected investment turns out to be successful in the market, perhaps the rejection was due to inadequate analysis. And with this we conclude today's lesson. Uh, here you can see a summary of what we have covered today. Uh, please go through it and revise. Uh, it is also worth reading from your textbook. Uh, it is also very highly recommended that you be proactive in your uh, way of studying financial statement analysis. It would help you a lot if you uh, take what, we ha what you have learned today and re do your own research and try to find examples on the internet it is very easy to google any of the concepts that you have studied uh, today and it is also very easy to find um, companies and examples online uh, of all the concepts that we uh, have covered so i will also try my best to um, upload a few examples for you uh, some financial statements perhaps um, and some also financial analysis reports uh, auditors reports and things like that it always helps to um, look at these um, and um, check out different um, different reports and things like that okay uh, thank you all for listening uh, please feel free to uh, participate in the discussion forum and ask questions during the lectures and on the forum exchange ideas um, discuss the concepts with your uh, classmates it will help you a lot since we don't have a class environment uh, right now uh, these um, uh, medias of uh, education could uh, prove uh, really valuable to you right now okay so be involved and i wish you the best of luck take care